Thanks everyone for coming in. So I'm assuming um, if you're in this room, you know who Iran Swartz is. Um, who doesn't know who Iran Swartz is? Nobody. Okay. So uh, how many of you have never heard of him before? He's your side. Okay. So um, maybe then we should just do a little bit of background on who the guy is. Yeah. And what is it about his death that's got us so worked up to do something like this? You want to do an intro? Yeah. So, uh, Aaron was actually uh, uh, so much to so many people. So he was uh, uh, a great hacker. Uh, he built a lot of uh, cool software. Uh, he wrote uh, the web file. He started programming. He was one of the co-founders of Reddit. And he did many more. Okay. But uh, that's not what actually uh, makes him so popular. So what makes him popular is uh, he actually used uh, technology uh, in to make a change in the society. So he's an activist. He was an activist. He uh, uh, he was one of the people uh, uh, who uh, was very active to stop the uh, SOPA. That's a uh, uh, stop on it. Stop on it. Act. Act bill. And he. Uh, uh, started uh, an organization for demand progress to actually uh, make a uh, social change. So he used to uh, uh, so uh, he used to build actually software tools uh, to actually run campaigns and all these things. And he was uh, say more. Yeah. So uh, Aaron's uh, career started fairly early. You know, he was born in nineteen eighty six. Um, that makes him a fairly young person. He was 26 when he died. And uh, when he was about um, 12 or 13, 14, you know, the first public achievement was when he was 14. But when he was 12 or 13, he started a website where he tried to basically build a database of all the world's knowledge. Now, you know that as Wikipedia today. But this was way before Wikipedia. This was some four or five years before Wikipedia when he tried to do something like this. And uh, obviously, it was way too early for its time. And I was 13 years old. You know, people don't take it seriously when doing something like that at that age. So, uh, but he kind of became notable when he was 14 years old, when he helped create the RSS standard, which is the standard used by blogs to allow your blog to be syndicated by another blog, use Google Reader, whatever. And uh, uh, the most important thing is that Iran Swartz did not invent RSS. He instead made a standard. And uh, the, the difference between inventing it and making the standard is a very significant thing to have happened mainly because of where RSS itself was coming from. Now, RSS is a fairly older protocol. Um, when the Netscape browser launched, which was back in 95, they realized that the first page that you open the browser to is obviously where everybody's going to start the internet journey from. And this was before Google existed. So it was an uh, interesting time because Netscape basically just put everybody onto the Netscape homepage. Then they realized that the homepage it didn't just be about saying we are Netscape based on our browser because obviously you're using the browser and you landed over there. So they started building a site where they said let's just put out news articles. Um, what will people want to see when it's on the internet? So you send them off to Yahoo and say Yahoo is a directory of all the interesting websites. Yahoo was not a search engine back then, it was a manually curated directory in those days. And so then from there the idea was how can we take headlines from other websites and put them on our website? So that when somebody downloads a browser and opens it, you get something useful to see. And that is really where the RSS specification originally came from. It was a simple XML file that another website would put up and even tell the Netscape website that, you know, here is the link to the RSS feed for my website, please copy the articles. And the standard itself was uh, mostly overseen by a chap named Dave Weiner, who's uh, was now a fellow at the, I think he's a fellow at the Berkman Center for Law in Harvard University. Um, back then he used to run a company called UserLand. And uh, they made a blocking software called UserLand. It was a desktop application. So basically it was a desktop app. You could type your post in the app. The app would generate a static HTML file. And then you upload the HTML file to your server. And that's how blogging used to work in the late 90s um, at the time of UserLand. So Dave Weiner created the RSS standard and part of what userland would do is it would go create an RSS file along with the HTML file and you could upload both of them. And therefore, when a server looks for a file, it gets a static file which has the latest generated content. You know, this was before dynamic programming existed 
before PHP became a proper programming language, before CGI was popular, before any kind of dynamic language existed. So today we use Python and Ruby and look at this and say, what is this? But back then it was all static files. So Dave Werner um, has a reputation for being both extremely smart and uh, a fairly arrogant and aggressive in person. So he doesn't really have a lot of patience with people who don't seem smart enough and can't defend themselves against him when he says this is why I should do something in a certain way. So the problem with RSS in that era was it was Dave Weiner's standards. And if you wanted to do something that did not match Dave Weiner's expectations, it was very difficult to reason with him because the guy just could always put out a technical argument and say that, no, this is what you're saying is wrong, this is the way I should, it should be done. So now all of this is public record. You know? It's all on the WBC mailing list archives. You can go look this up yourself. So userland was designed for a certain kind of output. It was designed to be a day-to-day -day journal. So if you look at the way a blog works, every post appears below the newer post. Right? So when you make a post, the newer one always comes on top. And this is, you, if it was any other way, you would be confused. Because this is how you are used to looking at a blog. But that was not the way userland did it. Userland was meant to be the full day's chronology. So it was not designed for writing one post at a time. It was designed for one line at a time. You write a line and say publish. That line goes off to your server. Okay? You write one more line, publish. So that's, that's basically what Twitter does these days that you do one tweet at a time. So in the user land approach, your entire day's log was top to bottom. Then the next day is on top. Okay. So but within the day, it's inverted order. It's in sequential order. Across days, it becomes chronological, there was chronological order. Okay. And so when you want to say that that is great, but other people are writing full length posts and they don't need this mix of chronologies. Now that was a slightly different thing to put in because userland would completely break down in its model of how to do blogging if you had to say, let's do some other way. So for day one, that became something to defend and say, you know, you guys are fine, but look, this is how I'm doing it. This is my standard. This is my software. I'm not going to change it just because you have different ideas about what I should do. So for a long time, that ended up being the statement. But you could not advance this specification. Or, or, or actually, because there was we'll actually this put a was both huh? smart and not willing to listen to anyone else. So you could not reason, nor could you tell him that why don't you look at something beyond your own ideas of what it should Oh, so uh, sorry. This is sorry. What put a practice? Guys, you can come and sit over here. You don't have to be embarrassed. I'm not some school teacher who will ask you questions if you sit in the front. Okay, and for the people in the back, you'll be really quiet because anything you whisper will be picked up by the camera out there. <laughs> so, in this scenario, along comes this 14 year old kid. This, this is all bullshit. This is how you should do it. And the guy goes and creates a completely new standard and gets into a very heated argument with Dave Weiner, who does not know how to react to 14 year old kid telling him he's wrong. He's used to people who have grown up in their 20s, in their 30s, in their 40s, who have businesses to run, who have commercial interests, who have something else to do in life. But here comes a kid who is not interested in school, he wants to sit and argue on the internet with his child, telling him, You're wrong. This is how you should do RSS. So, RSS. 0.9, which was the standard that uh, Dave Weiner's uh, proposed, and which was what was used at that time, was a simple XML file. And it had HTML embedded in it. And uh, how many of you are familiar with XML? Are you familiar with XML really? Do you know what strict XML is? Do you know what XML namespaces are? Are you guys aware that you cannot technically embed HTML inside XML? Because XML requires every tag to be closed and HTML does not. And therefore, when you put HTML inside XML, you're actually putting it as a simple text block, a quoted text block, a blog. You're not putting it in as an actual XML document. So basically then the RSS file was simply an XML file which contained direct chunks of HTML as a byte stream without checking for the actual kind of content. And therefore, it would 
uh, it was first of all not keeping with the spirit of XML. Obviously, as far as spec was concerned, here's a file which contains some chunks of data in it. You don't know what the data is. Um, but it kind of made it a lot harder to do something like say an access entry transformation that would take this file and render it into a web page. You couldn't do that because for your parser, there was just raw data. It was not parsable files. So, and that was that was one of the problems uh, with the binary standard. And so this man comes along and says we should use RDF. Now, RDF, rich data format. Who's heard of it? So, can someone explain what RDF is? What is the basic idea behind RDF? It's a it's a triplet driven um, format. So RDF is a language for describing the relationship between any two entities. Let's say Anand and I are sitting here. Now, what is the relationship between Anand and me? Um, there are a different ways to define this. Anand and me are sitting on this mattress. That's the relationship between us. Anand and me are both white or not white, but in a lot of canonical examples, you get white people. We are two brown peoples, both male, both geeks. You, you, you can find two ways to combine these two entities, you know, many different ways. And uh, the most common way of understanding this is as a thesaurus. What is a thesaurus? It re defines a relationship between two words in the dictionary. Now, a dictionary says here is a word and here is the meaning of the word. A thesaurus says this word is related to that word. They are either equal synonyms or they are related in a somewhat related way. You, know? um, you could say for instance that a word is a subset of the meaning of another word. Okay? Water is a liquid. Liquid doesn't necessarily mean water. So, so what do you have there is a one way relationship between entity A and entity B. It could say it's a subset or it's completely equivalent, it's just a same word in different language or something else. So you have these three pieces now which define this relationship. Entity A, entity B and the relationship. Okay. And RDF is an XML format for describing these triplets. Entity A, entity B, relationship. You carry them together as one bunch. And then there's an extra entry which has one more entry triplet like that. So RDF is um, extremely popular among people who believe in the semantic web. And who believe in the idea that a web page shouldn't just be human readable text, it should also contain relationships between the components of what you're saying so that a program can parse it and try to extract meaning out of it. Okay? Um, if you guys have been following what Facebook just did with the graph search, it's sort of a late stage realization of the same dream that you can find that a program can go search on the basis of some description that you put out okay? um, and say, find me friends who live in Bangalore who like a certain thing. Now, the way you do that is by RDF and say that Bangalore is a subset of Karnataka, which is in turn a subset of India and therefore you can kind of go up and down in that basis and say, if I say something, you know it means also means something else because of the relationships uh, diagram. So, Aaron Swartz at that time was very excited about RDF and uh, he looked at Dave XML and said, this is garbage, all you're doing is taking HTML, converting into a binary blob and putting it inside an XML file. You know, this is a very, very primitive way of doing things. Why don't we just redo the whole thing and think of it as RDF? Um, and so RSS 1.0, which was the standard that he helped push through, mainly by outfitting Dayweiler in argument. You know, and putting Dayweiler in a situation where he had no idea how to respond to this kid who basically had more time than he did and um, had no way to that we can attack him. I mean, the guy is a kid. What can you do to him? You know, you can't abuse a kid in public. Um, and you will see Dayweiler's emails on the public archives talking about exactly this and saying, I don't care anymore that this guy is a kid. You know, he's been harassing me for all these days. Um, this is on record, okay? So <laughs> go look it up. Um, RSS 1.0 ended up becoming the standard based on RDF, mainly because of this kid who managed to push it through. Now, if you guys actually use a blog and you have an RSS feed, it is not RSS 1.0, it is RSS 2.0. The reason is RDF itself um, is great in theory, but what the heck does RDF have to do with the blog? I mean, post 1, post 2, post 3, post 4. Where is the relationship diagram in this? You know, I'm not defining a relationship saying post 1 is defined as a relationship to post 2 because it is one is newer than the other. That's bullshit. You just put them in a sequence. That's all you need to know. So RDF turned out to actually be a bad choice of standard for RSS. And RSS 2.0 went back to the dev viral model, but it um, cleaned up the model a little bit more and said, um, don't do this bullshit thing of putting this as a binary blob inside. You can come and sit here. Okay. You can come here. Okay, um, why don't you guys move this side? Because
So that was the first notable achievement. Um, kid who knows what he's talking about and knows how to argue and manages to push something through to being a standard. Um, and uh, that was the point where also he started drawing enough attention that uh, he ended up getting introduced to Lawrence Lessig, who at that time was just starting work on Creative Commons. Creative Commons, um, uh, I'm sure all of you know what Creative Commons is now. Is there anyone who does not know what Creative Commons is? Never heard of it. You never heard of Creative Commons? No. None of you. So Creative Commons is a set of licenses. Um, I'm sure you guys know open source. Okay. Uh, what ultimately is open source? When you get software, software, it comes under license which defines the terms of use. And the license is designed to be very liberal in saying you can use this any way you want. Why do you need a license? Because open source rights on top of copyright law. No? That copyright law itself is many centuries old at this point. And copyright law says something that if I get out some software, it is mine, I can decide what to do with it. And if you copy it, then you are violating my copyright and I can take you to court. And that means that you cannot use anybody else's software unless I also give you the terms of use. And say, this is my software, but you can use it as long as you meet my conditions. And that's basically how all software is licensed. That somebody wants copyright, they give you a license, they use it. And therefore, to share software, because copyright law itself is a danger, because I may be looking like a nice guy and say, I wrote my software, use it. And later on, I'll say, no, you violated my copyright. So the license becomes a way that I assure you that when I give you the software, I'm giving you freedom to do what you want with it. Okay? And at no point can I come back and harass you about this. That, that's basically what a license means. Now, software licenses are not very suitable for projects that are not software driven. Um, suppose um, I'm an artist, I do a painting, okay? and I said, This is my drawing, but you can copy it. Make copies of this, do printouts of this, whatever. Um, if you read the text of a software license, it says things like um, binary linking and source code and whatnot. And what the heck is a source code in a painting? Painting, take it. Yeah. So, most creative works, um, whether it's music or writing, you got a blog post. Where's the source code in there? It's the text. Um, you read anything else that uh, essentially is creative expression. The free software lessons don't work very well. Now, for a long time, people actually use this. You would see, uh, before Creative Commons existed, you would see a lot of um, text which came with the GPL license. Yeah. And um, it obviously made no meaning, and therefore people tried other things. So there was at one point or something called the open content license, and then there was a sister license called the open publication license, and these two were designed around books. And so open publication license came with a bunch of rules saying how could, what are the conditions under which you can reproduce this book and make your own version. And so OPL and OCL both were very popular for a while, um, but the problem again is that they were designed around books. Now what if I made some music and I said you can take this riff that I've created and go create something else on top of it, maybe do a dub or whatever it is, you know. Um, once again, these licenses were not useful. So people <coughs> kept making their own one-off licenses. And the problem with that now is uh, I can't build a, a library of such donated works. You know, if I have given out some work and said it's free for use and you're given out some, and there's a huge collection of these that people have given out, um, it's very difficult for me to now say, find me something that I have the rights to use. Because now you read each one of these licenses and say which of these licenses says what. One guy will say you can do whatever you want provided you put my name as the original creator. Other guy will say I don't care about my name. Third guy will say you must also credit my university because they paid my fees when I was doing this composition and whatnot. Now these problems can only be solved actually reading the damn text every single time. So it becomes very difficult to use a electronic library where you can say please computer please go find me something. Okay, if you have under a certain license. So the simple idea at that point was why don't we create a bunch of licenses which basically cover all the common ways in which people want to share. Um, Jay, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I just had a question. What yeah. about the copyleft license? That was GPL was one. There was no copyleft license as such. Yeah, copyleft copyleft is basically I don't I want to use a copyright. It's like the exact opposite. No, the like copyleft is using it. copyright to go against copyright. Yeah. So See, copyright itself is not a software thing. Copyright is, is kind of down at a very fundamental level in, in law. And therefore, you cannot give up copyright. Like even in India, you're not allowed to give up copyright. Yeah. You still have copyright. Yeah, I left that so you must use a license then to basically waive your rights using copyright. So you can use copyright for that, right? 
Copyleft is just a concept, you know. I mean, all of this ultimately is a concept. Okay. Copyleft is not an actual license. Yeah. yeah but for a long time, I've seen the FSF use the copyleft license. Yeah, and that I that use is GPL. that for my blog too. Okay, but and that is GPL. Yeah, okay. Okay. I mean, basically, is the idea that you use copyright to defeat copyright. Okay. So, um, Lawrence Lessig was, uh, well, still is a professor at Harvard University, and uh, he figured um, there was a need for making a bunch of licenses which basically captured all the common sharing patterns. And uh, if you look at uh, what are the common sharing patterns, you know, there are a bunch of them. Um, I'm going to list them all, but I don't know if it's comprehensive. Somebody can look at the website and tell me. Um, the first one, attribution. If I made something, I don't want it's somebody else to do it. Guys, come inside here. Come, come inside. something, um, obviously I'm the creator. You have the authority to use it because I've given you a free license, but you're not the creator. I'm the creator. So the very first one is attribution. The condition in which I'm giving you this is you cannot claim you made this. You can. You have to say that I made this, although you're free to do what you want with it. So attribution is the first one. Second thing, um, I may not be in the mood for you to make money from my creation. I made something and said, please use this. But you don't go make a fortune and don't give me back anything. You know? uh, sometimes you want that condition. You, say, you can use this as long as you're not making money from this. If you're making money from it, then come back to me and negotiate a separate license. Second condition. Third condition, uh, no derivatives. I made some music. I don't, or rather, let's use a better example. I made a drawing. I made a nice cartoon character of some kind. Now you went to put a mustache on my guy to make him look funny. Uh, I don't like that. And I'm going to give you a condition saying you can use my work, but don't derive it. Don't modify it, do something else. So that's one more condition that I may use. Uh, the next condition is um, I gave you something. You took it and said, from now on, I'm going to sell this. I'm not going to let anybody else have it for free. Especially if I allowed you to make derivatives. So. I made a cartoon character, you went and put a moustache on the character, it probably catch it like this. But you're seeing from now on, this is your work. And you are not allowing anybody else to make any more changes on top of your work. And my license do not stop you from that, because I simply said, you can do, do what you want with this. So the condition I can impose on you is no derivatives, okay? uh, or um, share alike. And say, if I give it to you, and said you can do what you want with it, under the condition that you don't change the license term for the next person. So, attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives, share alike. Four attributes that normally go when you're sharing. You may or may not choose to have any of these things. So, what Creative Commons did was basically created licenses which were a combination of these things. You could say, I want this plus that, but not that. And you could go to the website and pick the condition that you want to share with, and it'll give you a license and say, K2 Commons Attribution. K2 Commons Attribution, non-commercial, share alike. Pick what you want. Share alike is like a viral. It is it's a similar to the GPL. It's similar to the GPL, which basically says same conditions for the next person also. Um, so share alike only makes sense if you are not using the no derivatives clause. Because if there's, no, if there's an ND clause, then SE is not required. Because anyway, now they can get back to you for those null source. So uh, when this was started off, now one of the problems again is if I have attached a Creative Commons license to my code, how does some software discover it and basically build a search engine that can find everything licensed under a certain type of license? Um, along comes Jaron Schwartz, sends a mail to Lawrence Lessig and saying, I have been working on this thing called RDF, it's perfect for this. Here is my work, here is the license. Okay. And this work is available under this license, three terms. You see? <coughs> this is the Creative Commons license, this is your work. <coughs> and the conjunction in between them is this license applies to this work. <coughs> so we came up with RDF there as a way of saying um, if you make something, you can use RDF to attach <coughs> a license to it and put those two things out together. Okay? And what this lets you do then is it allows you to put it out in a way that the search engine can go analyze this. You know? And for instance, you know that. Um, <coughs> 
something is a subset of something else. If I put a non-commercial clause on the license, okay, and I'm looking for something, and I don't care about the non-commercial clause because I don't want commercial use anyway. <coughs> so you can give me results which both have non-commercial and don't have non-commercial, as long as they're Creative Commons. Yeah. So you can you, you can make a search engine on the basis of that, and that's what RDF is for, because it defines the relationship between the licenses and say one license is a subset of another license. It adds additional clauses, it removes additional clauses. You can search for it. So that was his contribution at that point, and this was when he was roughly um, 15 years old. Um, I don't remember the exact year this happened. It probably was like 1999, 2000, 2001, sometime. Um, if you've seen a picture of Lawrence Lessig sitting with uh, this young kid, Aaron Swartz, uh, that was around this time when the Creative Commons licenses just came out. So that was his next major contribution. And uh, can you find the picture of Lessig with Swartz? It's a Wikipedia yeah. article yeah. about Aaron. He's wearing an oversized t-shirt. Exactly. And, uh, now, this is uh, one of them. This is another one of them. Yeah, you can, you can hold it up and let other people see it. So you can see the guy was actually just a little kid when he did all these things. It's on screen. Yeah. It's on yeah, I don't know what you guys were up to when you were 15, but I certainly was not doing things like that. They <laughs> <laughs> might have built licenses that the whole world uses now. Um, so, roughly at that point, he tried going back to school, finishing his school. Um, then he went to Stanford University, he dropped out of Stanford, kind of had trouble staying in school because it was just not interesting enough. I mean, if you're doing something as groundbreaking as this, yeah. and you go back to school and they say, beta, this is what physics means. <laughs> <laughs> it's not very interesting anymore. <laughs> um, so, I don't remember at what age this was, but. Um, so you just uh, clarify, so RDF is is a format that, that Aaron... That allows you to base... RDF was, is older than Aaron. I, it's older than So, yeah. so who, who is uh, one? I mean, who, who was uh, it? RDF is, I think, Tim Berners-Lee. Tim Berners-Lee. Because Tim Berners-Lee is the big guy pushing RDF in the semantic web and all these ideas. Back, back then? Back then also, like the, the late 90s. Um, and so, at some point, uh, Aaron Swartz dropped out of college. Uh, this was when Y Combinator had just started off. So the very first uh, batch of Y Combinator was in Boston. Now they're in, um, they're in somewhere in the valley, I don't know which part. So back then it was in Boston, right now Y Combinator, who's never heard of it? Everybody knows Y Combinator, my person doesn't know it. Okay, Y Combinator is a startup school. If you're trying to start up a company, they are a school, they take you in for three or four months, they give you some money, um, roughly about 10,000 US dollars, which is about 5 lakh rupees in India. Uh, they give you a little bit of money, they cover your accommodation for the 4 month period, and they teach you how to run a company. And basically, they also take an investment, so it's uh, between 8 to 15 percent, depending on uh, um, how your interview with them goes and at what stage of your startup you are and how much traction you have, how much experience you have, and so forth. <coughs> I think they're now standardized, they don't do this anymore, it's kind of a fixed percentage. I don't remember exactly what, 8 or 10 percent. But the basic idea being that they take a risk on a bunch of kids, telling them that we think you may or may not know how to run a business, but you're certainly smarter than the average kid on the street. So give me some money, let's see if you can build a company out of it. Uh, so he went into the very first batch, and he started a company called Infogami, which was a wiki. Um, it was a wiki project trying to collect information. And uh, Infogami itself did not last very long. But while he was in Y Combinator, they introduced him to this other company called Reddit. They told him why did he join that. So Aaron Swartz joined the team of Reddit. He was, I think, the fourth person in the place. Um, I don't remember exactly, but he's not a co founder, but because he was the third or fourth person to join the place. So actually, uh, so uh, uh, Graham actually suggested to merge Infogami and Reddit. So okay. both the companies got merged. Okay, but they kept the Reddit game. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, they're running both, both of them together, okay? okay. So Reddit got, so Reddit got like bets along with it, even info coming right now. Okay. Yeah, so the merger companies, um, <coughs> obviously because he was very early stage, he got uh, equity, and that turned out to be a good exit a little later. But at that point, um, Reddit itself, Reddit was an online discussion forum. So 
again, who's ever used Reddit? I don't know. A lot of people think Reddit is no ideas. Um, Reddit, R-E-D-D-I-T.com. You can waste all their time. It's a discussion for it. Actually, 4chan. 4chan is a much later stage thing. Right? Yeah. It's very niche. Reddit is mainstream. Yeah. I mean, Reddit is where Barack Obama goes to talk to the public. Mm -hmm. So, <coughs> Reddit is basically a discussion for many things goes on Reddit. You make a post saying, I found this interesting link, it's funny, go laugh, I found a cat picture, whatever else, anything goes on Reddit. And um, depending on how many votes you get, you go on the home page. Otherwise, you go on a sub internet page where people who are specialized in a certain kind of thing will find you and vote you up until you get voted on the front page. And if you stay on the front page, then a lot more people see it. So, Reddit is now one of the biggest sources of traffic if you have managed to make it to the front page. It, um, it's, um, it's got a huge population. It's built out into being a surprisingly um, nice place to be for a lot of people. In the sense that Reddit is extremely <coughs> liberal. It's a place where you can talk about anything. It's a place that is not very tolerant of hate speech. Um, at the same time, it's a place that is very, very tolerant of people who think differently. Okay? Um, and that's not an easy thing to pull off. But when you're trying to do, look at mainstream news articles. There's a news article on saying that something happened you know, somewhere. And look at the comments. Usually, it'll be a bunch of guys saying, go hang this fellow, you know, go cut his balls off, go do something ridiculous. You, you see this in comments in news articles for any site. No, Reddit is the worst place to go in India. Uh, you go to Reddit, you will not see this. Uh, I don't know how they put this off, but they have managed to build a community that has hundreds of thousands of people on it who actually are nice to each other most of the time. Um, you need to scroll all the way to the bottom of the page. <laughs> the you see all of them. Is. They're all there. They're not gone they're, they're anywhere. All there. But they, they've <laughs> found a way to hide it from you. <laughs> so what they've done is built a community that knows how to moderate itself. And essentially, as a result of the moderation, represent itself as being a very safe place to be in. Okay. Um, and so that, that is really what the technology that they built uh, pulled off. It's not very difficult technology. Ultimately, it's just about how do you vote someone up or down. And, um, the initial version of the website was built in Lisp. And uh, when Infogaming merged into uh, Reddit, the also came in with and said this code is not maintainable, maintainable, let's redo it. So he did rewrote the whole thing in the Python language. And uh, as part of that, he created the framework that's called Web.py, okay, which we'll be talking about also today. Uh, Anand's going to do a tutorial on how to use Web.py for your own projects. So Web.py is a micro framework. If you guys have done any Python programming, you've probably heard of Django. Django is the big daddy in the framework scene for the Python language. Web.py has basically 1% or 0.1% of the features of Django. It's not meant to be a Django replacement. It's meant to be about say, you want to build a very small website for a very specific purpose, and you don't want to bring in a whole lot that you never use in your libraries, use Web.py. Okay? Uh, it's great for that. So that <coughs> framework was created at Reddit as the transition to Python. Reddit itself does not use it anymore. Because obviously it's not um, a framework that becomes easy to work with as your site gets much bigger. Uh, it does very little and therefore everything is your work on top. So for what it's worth, he was there for a while. Reddit uh, became extremely popular. It got acquired by this company called Condé Nast. Condé Nast um, used to run a bunch of travel magazines. And um, they were a big name publisher in the US. And somewhere in the 90s, they suddenly started getting excited about technology and started buying technology companies. So the first big one they bought is the Wired magazine. Wired uh, was a magazine that essentially was the champion of the internet era in the mid-90s. They were the magazine that first started publishing stories about how great the internet is going to be. So for a lot of people, they're considered as being the place where very bunch of smart people went to work as writers. And therefore, if you're ever a Wired writer in the past, then you're trusted as being the kind of guy who knows how to think about what technology is going to be exciting in a few years because you have a track record of doing that. Um, but that's that's basically what the excitement about Wired itself is. So when Condé Nast acquired Reddit, um, obviously this guy's stock options became worth a lot of money. And this was uh, also just at the midpoint of the, you know, the second era of the dot-com boom, right? it was 2005 or so. So this was... Yeah, 2005. 2005, right? So it was roughly, the dot-com boom died in 2000, you know, when the whole industry collapsed. But 2005 was coming up again. So once again, Web 2.0 companies were suddenly the new hot thing. 
And so Condon has essentially paid a lot of money for this um, and read it. And uh, Aaron Swartz realized that working at a big corporate was not the thing for him at all. You know, he was a guy who basically liked to run off on his own and do things. And it ended up being a very difficult period for him there, working in a big corporate environment. And a few months later, they just fired him, saying that no, this is not working out. You just are not doing anything. No, he actually went on. He went on. He went on, 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 on a holiday to yeah. Europe. Yeah. Attended some conference there. I think uh, he yes, was computing. Put it on yes, the And he was interviewed by Wired. Yeah. And he was on the home page of Wired or yeah. Wired.com. Yeah. And, uh, and his and boss, boss said, didn't know. And his, his, his boss, boss didn't know I was gone. gone. So his boss came to know from his blog. <laughs> yeah. So, so it was quite funny because um, the guy absconding from work, he's gone off on some holidays, gone to a conference. The other part of the company features him as his big heroes come up over there. <laughs> and then this guy comes back and reports for work. <laughs> then he goes, what shit? <laughs> obviously, they've not been having a nice time with him because uh, of um, the fact that he couldn't settle into a corporate environment and he just didn't like working with all these other people and so forth. And they laid him off at that point. And uh, to his credit, he agreed, which basically meant to it not get cash on his hands. Because um, if you have if you have recently been acquired, if your company has recently been acquired by another company, there's a vesting period before which you're not allowed to cash in your shares. You know, like if you say own 25% of a company and you sold it for a certain amount of money, but you don't get that cash right away. But part of the condition is unless you stay for a certain part to your period, you're not going to actually get that cash. So that is meant to be the transition period. And uh, this guy was expelled. And now what happens to his shares? Obviously he gets all of the cash right away. And uh, that was when he got to this point in his life where he didn't have to work anymore. Okay? And uh, that was the start of his career saying, okay, now let's go do interesting things. Okay? And uh, that was the point where he got off into his activism career. And said, let's do stuff now that helps make the world a better place because I don't have to worry about making money on a day-to-day basis. Uh, one of the first things he did, he started working with the Internet Archive. The Internet Archive is a non-profit that's based in San Francisco. Um, they started off trying to build an archive of the internet. Uh, what does that mean? What would an archive of the internet be? The Recording sites which go offline, their content is archived by different... As it changes different also. Different yeah. Exactly. So they keep track of every web page in the world that has changed over time and give you a copy of the old version of the same website. Let's see if we want to see the old home page of uh, maybe 2000 yeah. Exactly. Of any time in the past. You want to see what did this website look like at this point in the past? You go to archive.org and search for it, and they will tell you. Here are the bunch of snapshots that we have captured of this page in '99, in 2000, all the way up to the present day. And you can go see what websites look like. Now, if you ever had a website where you put up embarrassing pictures of yourself and then decided to delete it, um, archive.org is where it's still alive. <laughs> so, search for his name. <laughs> yeah, you, you find all kinds of stuff. Um, Unfortunately, their archives are not very good also, uh, mainly because you put them on a server, a hard disk will crash. Okay? Archive.org has a lot of these problems. And uh, the uh, problem with um, trying to archive the internet is the internet being the huge thing that it is. You're saying you want to keep a copy of every single page, both present and past, for every single time it changed for all time in one little building in San Francisco. You're not going to have enough space to even keep that many hard disks in there. So, one of their problems is with the fact that they keep losing <coughs> their archives um, whenever a hard disk crashes. And uh, because it's data that nobody is paying to keep, you know, they are doing it just as being librarians. You know, they're thinking, you know, this is the internet version of being a library. When you say that a library keeps a copy of every single book ever, the internet library has to keep a copy of every single web page that ever existed. Um, but if you're not paying for it, if nobody is paying to maintain it, then Nobody is going to ensure redundancy in data and keeping two copies and ensuring that your building burns down or your hard disk crashes is a backup. So that's one of the problems with the archive. Um, it's unfortunate, but there's not much anyone to do except give them some more money and say, please buy more hard disk. Um, but what they've also been doing is expanding on their mission and saying, this, given that they started off with trying to archive web pages, what else do you need to be archived? And one of the problems is if you want a list of all the books that have ever been published in the world. Where do you go for this list? Resources list. Um, you can hear about some book that somebody published some 400 years ago, which ended up being influential in its country. But um, 
Gutenberg? Gutenberg is a transcript of books that are in the public domain and volunteer contributed. But if you want to get a list of books, where do you get it? You know, do you want to know, has a certain topic ever been covered in a book? How do you find out? You can go to Amazon and search for the topic, but Amazon only tells you what's in print. Okay. Um, if it's not in print, then they're not interested, then they can't sell it to you. So where do you go to find out historical archives? And one way to do that is to go to every library that's important and say, please give me a list of your catalog. Okay. Give me a copy of your catalog and let's go collect catalogs from libraries around the world and therefore not to work an archive. And it turns out that if you're in the US, then there is one such master catalog which is the Library of Congress. Because uh, if you look at the way copyright law works in the US, uh, you can get copyright protection for your book if you give a copy of the book to the government. You say, here is my book, please make sure that it's not copied. And if it's ever copied, then I will come back to you and in court and say that, look, that guy is copying my book. And you have a copy of my book, so you have proof that I'm the original you know, publisher of this book. That's, that's basically part of the legal system. And so the Library of Congress is a US government body that was established fairly long back, I think fairly early in the history of the country, whose job is to keep two copies of every single book ever published in the US. And therefore, they have that catalog. You are not You don't have the world's catalog of books, but at least you have the American catalog of books. And it's a huge catalog. And if you go to the Library of Congress and say, please give me a copy of the catalog, they say, not happy. It's a private catalog, you have to pay for it. And they say that it, it costs us so much money to maintain it. And it's not like people are paying us to give us books and keep maintenance and so on. So you pay for a copy of this catalog. The that would have been fine, except for another little bit in the US Constitution, which says if something was funded with public money, there is no copyright on it. Um, you have a constitutional right to have access to anything that you are tax paid for. And uh, the implementation back then is they don't differentiate between whether you're a taxpayer or not a taxpayer because if you look at the way the US is geographically, uh, it's a completely different continent. It's not like some guy from England will come over and say, give me a copy of all your documents because uh, after all, it's public domain. You know, that was not their worry. Their worry was you, you're not going to be physically in that space in the 1700s when the constitution was written. You're not going to be physically in the space unless you are from that area and you're a citizen. And so, in the constitution, it simply says public. If it was paid for by public money, it belongs to the public. There is no copyright on this. Nobody dare prevent you from taking this. Um, which basically means that the Library of Congress is funded by the government because it's part of their copyright system. And so, if the Library of Congress has a catalog, the catalog is not copyrighted. So, does it mean it applies to maybe outside the also? Yeah, it is because the constitution does not differentiate between citizens. It simply says public. The public domain and their public domain basically says that nobody wants this. <coughs> and so, um, when the Internet Archive was trying to build their uh, archive of books, their problem was they did not have a reference point and say, first of all, do we even know what books are ever published? And where do you get this data from? The most reliable source is the Library of Congress, which will at least cover the US book collection. <coughs> the problem is the Library of Congress refuses to give it to you. They charge you money for the same that it's a commission service, this is how we fund the library. But Heron Swartz comes along, looks at this and says, but the catalog itself is not copyrighted. Because they can't. By constitution, they're not allowed to copyright this catalog. They can charge you for a copy. But after that, what you do with it is up to you. So the fellow went and bought a copy. And it's not cheap. He spent a huge part of his personal fortune in buying that copy and put it in the internet after it. And said, I have liberated one of the big databases that has been locked up for a couple of centuries. <coughs> So that was one big contribution. It cost quite a bit of uproar at that point. Because a lot of people say, but then how will the Library of Congress send the next copy? You know? Nobody else is going to buy it because you put it out for free on the internet now. Um, and so that's not my problem. The Constitution says it's not <laughs> copyrightable. You know? Just because you managed to convince all these other people in the past that because they spent a copy, they should keep it for themselves, doesn't mean that it's copyrighted. Um, so that was one big achievement it sent. Uh, a few shopwaves around the copyright industry, realizing that you can't uh, think of it as what it used to be like pre-internet when you didn't have kids with too much money on their hands. Yeah. And so that was one notable achievement. Now the second one is uh, with case law. If you're a lawyer, you know how 
legal system works. Um, there's a constitution which is a fundamental document of your country which basically defines the basic boundaries of what law can do and can't do. And then there is a law itself. You have the parliament in India which makes laws. You have the state assemblies in each state which makes state level laws. And the constitution defines the boundary between what law the central government can make and what law the state government can make. But when it comes to actually going to court, it is not the law itself that comes, it's also how this law was argued in court before. You know? So a legal case is always on the basis of when was this law last tested in court and what was the outcome at that point. And so when you go and say that a certain incident is a violation of the law, what the court will do is go look and say, has this law been argued in court before? And say, look, in that particular case, the judge said that. And therefore, we are going to say the same thing. Because if you uphold a previous judgment, nobody is going to question you on that. It's saying that somebody else made the decision in a similar case already. If you are going to say something completely new, then you can take it up to the higher court and argue it further. So case law is the most fundamental uh, basis on which you actually treat a law. So if you are a lawyer and now you want to say, let's go find out. Uh, when was this case last argued in court? Where do you get this data? Obviously, the court records have it. But of all the different courts in the country, which court was this law argued in? Somebody's got to maintain the database. And the US government does this. Uh, part of their process also is they have a public archive of all case law. Anytime a case was argued, those records are in their system. And uh, Firstly, if you look at again the way um, court documents are archived, they have this very specific legal language that they use. You know, they, where they always say that this is the party in the case and they put down their names and then um, they have a certain way of describing the phrases when they use when they use to refer to the basis on which something is being argued. And these are things that you can to some extent pass with the computer and say please try and make some the language because it's not proper English, it's a very restricted form of the language. So it's much easier to therefore write a national language parser that can make sense of this. If there are lots of guys working on this kind of stuff, you can do it. Now, legal case law is, um, they have this system called the Public Access uh, Records and so on. It, uh, it's an acronym that everywhere is to place a P A C E R. I think Public Access to Case and something else. I don't know if you find what it is. Uh, just Google for it, you find it on Wikipedia. So once again, it's an electronic archive. Some department did it. Somebody's got to pay for all these computers. There are electronic records. records. I think it's just, sorry. Yeah, is it? Uh, once again, court electronic records. Court electronic records, yeah. So that is the basis on which they archive the documents. So if you want a copy of a document, a, a law, a legal case that happened sometime in the past, and you want to get it from this archive, they charge you on a per page basis. I think it's 20 cents per page to get a copy of what happened in the past. Um, per page sounds reasonable, except if you look at the fact that a typical case runs into hundreds of pages. And if you're trying to say all instances of a certain law being argued in court in the past, you're going to spend a small fortune just getting a copy of it from the database. Actually, they have to charge uh, researchers as well. So for so many bytes, they consider one page and they actually charge it. Yeah. So and that is a way of keeping the database alive. Except, once again, this is not computable data. It's all paid for with public money and therefore, you can charge me for access, but you can't charge me afterwards to do what I want with this data that I got from you. And uh, obviously, the archives are so huge that nobody was stupid enough to say, like with the Library of Congress thing last time, that let us go spend money on buying all this data and giving it away to the public. But this was just too large a database. And uh, at one point, something interesting happened. So obviously, for a lot of people, it was like, for a lawyer also, it's very difficult to say, how do I argue in court if I don't know what's happened before and I can't afford this? So that's ultimately what your client is paying for. Now, why is going to court so expensive? It's because the lawyer is paying the government for access to US cases. So uh, at one point, uh, the US government figured that we need to fix this problem. So we will make it so that access to PACER is free if you go to a public library. And sit in the library and use the library's computer. And this guy looks at this and says, wow. The next day he goes to the library with a thumb drive, starts his download. <laughs> <laughs> um, eventually, people figure out what's going on and they shut down the access. But by that time, he's downloaded 20% of the entire archive in all history. Okay? 
and takes it home, puts it on the internet archive, which is free data, <laughs> free of copyright. Um, now, when he does this, um, suddenly he's gone and impacted a completely different animal from the Library of Congress. Library of Congress, bunch of librarians. You know, you have ruined their business model, but the librarians, what will they do? Now you've gone and hit the lawyers. You know, you've ruined a lawyer's business model. And so that was when the FBI gets involved and they go investigate this guy and say, who is this kid who's causing such problems in society? Um, they didn't find anything. But they did think of this guy as a potential criminal and say, can we find out if he's done something that is illegal? Um, nothing came up. But that was a point where they started following him and saying, we need to watch this guy because he's going around upsetting public institutions, um, doing something that is completely legal, but at the same time, he's a menace to society. You know, he's a disrupting the established order. So this was 2008, wasn't it, Pacer? Yeah. Yeah, the Pacer incident was 2008. Um, I remember when this happened, you know, it was like, a lot of us like, wow, some kid is doing something stupid, let's see if he gets into trouble or not. Um, but at that point, it also got him a lot of attention from a whole bunch of other parties. And this was also a time when he didn't really have to do much in life, mainly <coughs> because uh, he still had the unit money. Yeah. And it's not like he was living a high expense lifestyle. So later on, I think, was this 2009 or 2010? I don't remember when. Um, he came to know of something else that was happening in, um, in, in the Congress. The Congress is the US equivalent of the parliament. And um, he heard of something where some new law was being introduced in court. It was called the Stop Online Piracy Act. It was sponsored by the media industry, the movie industry, movie and music industry, who obviously had a big problem with people torrenting movies. And they wanted new law that would allow them to go chase people who are distributing movies illegally online and find a way to stop them. And one of the provisions was that if your website is suspected of um, helping copyright infringement, then we can ask the government to shut down your website, which previously the government had no authority to do. Um, and so SOPA was designed for that intention, but then if you read it, it says, basically says, I suspect you of infringing copyright, therefore I can take your website down. Now I can say anything I want, you know, I can claim that, I mean, it's not like Library of Congress where I have to submit a book as proof that I wrote this book. Now, I can always say that, hey, that was, I wrote that and you copied it and therefore shut down this website. No, and there is no court process, there is nothing involved. So, um, it was nice to say that it is supposed to prevent this industry from being destroyed. But the flip side is that a lot of other people can use it for anything they want. You don't like what somebody is saying about your government, shut it down. Yeah. It's basically what's happening with India with the IT Act, with Section 66A. It is used to shut down anyone who says anything you don't like. Some girl says something about Balthagari on Facebook. She gets arrested, her father's the hospitals burned down, I mean, things like that happen as part of what the law allows in India. And SOPA was coming up in Congress. Uh, there's a video that you can watch about this. I think it, it's Aaron speaking about his own efforts to stop it at that point. And he can explain it himself a lot better than I can. But basically, when he discovered this, um, he and a bunch of guys decided that they need to start a national campaign to make sure it does not pass in Congress, which basically means that when a congressman goes to vote, um, he needs to be able to say that I voted this despite of the fact that my constituency wrote to me saying don't vote for this. Okay. Um, then because becomes problem saying how the heck did you go against your own constituency when they have certain sentiment. Uh, but for that your constituency has to write to this guy first. And so they started a national campaign saying how quickly can we get the entire country to be aware of what's about to pass in Congress and get them to write to their representatives and tell them stop it. Um, so, that effort was called Demand Progress. And so Demand Progress, you are on the website. You can read about the campaign, how they did this. And uh, effectively, over a three-day period, they managed to galvanize enough support to stop it from passing. Um, in India, that's very unlikely to happen. It's very, very unlikely that you can do that kind of um, the public uprising in that short a period. On something that most people don't understand, like in India, when the IT Act passed, nobody cared. There was not a hint of uproar anywhere. No media coverage, no public outrage, no blogging outrage. It was a very few, it was small institutions like CIS, which basically made a huge cry about it. Probably because nobody knows about it and 
So why is the lack of awareness high? Because nobody is spreading awareness. And this is not a problem that is different by culture. It's a problem that happens because somebody is pushing for awareness. And we don't have enough funding for awareness campaigns out here. So that was the difference. That you know, a bunch of guys who are both technically savvy and had enough personal backing to be able to say, I will do this full time without worrying about work. Without worrying about going to the office tomorrow and saying, how do I make sure I don't lose my job in the process? So, I managed to do this over a three or four day period and then it came back in a new form. The first version was called something else. It was called uh, CUSP or something. Then it got rejected in Congress, then it came back as SOPA, which is the more popular one where the campaign to stop SOPA was much longer and uh, much more publicized. Okay. Um, can you put up the video? Yeah. Oh, actually, shall we look at the video after we finish this? Or sure. See now? So, that, that, I mean, it's a 20 minute video, so it, it goes into detail about how we discovered this campaign and uh, what we did to stop it. Uh, after that, obviously, now this guy was in the other state. Okay. Not legally, he had done no violation of law. But he had a lot of people in the government very, very upset over the fact that this was a guy who was telling Congress how to behave. Uh, and obviously at this point, anything he did would have been watched over quite a bit. And uh, he did end up making a mistake, which ended up in what finally happened to him. So sometime in 2010, he discovered something else that needed to be liberated. And this time it was an archive called JSTOR. Um, who knows what JSTOR is? So JSTOR is short for general storage. And what JSTOR does is um, they archive um, academic literature. You know, if you're a professor, then you have to write about what you're working on, what your research projects are. And there's a system of publication for this. You know, usually it's a peer review process. So you send it to every journal, which will send it to a bunch of people who are in the same field as you for their comments. And if they all say it's a good publication, then it goes to print. So this is fairly elaborate system of scientific results being reviewed and published as and then reviewed in public by people who say that they agree or disagree with the results. And that's basically how scientific advancements work um, in general. That this is how the field of science works. So it's a very fundamental part of how academia itself works. And um, this work now is not government funded. Most of the time, I mean, a lot of the time, because a lot of the time it's a private university professor who is basically whose fees are paid by students and it's not paid by the government. So now you can't say it's a copyright thing anymore. It's because it's not a constitutionally protected uh, free copyright thing. At the same time, there are a lot of guys who are completely upset about the fact that this is education. You know, you're denying education by not giving someone access to a certain document. Um, and uh, the the way it works, once again, is. Uh, because of the review process, it is fairly expensive for getting something published. In the sense that somebody has got to pay for all this coordination work of sending it out to different people for reviews, getting their comments in and so forth. And the writer does not get paid. So if you are a professor who is publishing a research report, you are not paid for the publication. Nor are you paid for reviewing somebody else's publication. That process is completely free. The only people who get paid are the people in the administrative side of the part, in the, working in the journal. And uh, this for it, many universities was um, not very feasible because um, it's expensive and you're depending on a lot of free labor plus a lot of problems. So most university presses started off with this idealistic idea of saying that our university will be a research powerhouse, we will publish our own journal, we will put out articles uh, showing what our professors are doing. But then they realize that this is not working out and uh, they end up selling off a university press to a private company to run it. And so a couple of companies in the US are now the publishers of most scientific journals. Um, one is Elsevier, the other one I forgot what. Springer. Springer. Yeah. So there are two companies which publish most of these journals. And now these guys are effectively monopolies. And their way of making money is they charge you to read an article. Um, which is obviously how it works when you buy a magazine. You're paying to read the article. You bought a magazine at the newsstand. After that, you know what you want to do. But when publications start moving online, now we are saying to see it on the website also, you have to pay to see the article. They give you the free abstract for free. They give you the abstract for free, yeah. but for the, the article rest you pay, is, it's yeah. a fairly steep rate. You know, sometimes it goes up to like $20 to $30 per article. Yeah. And that's a lot of money. It is the 
one article about some topic, then you wouldn't pay that much to read a newspaper. No, you wouldn't pay a thousand people a day to see what the newspaper say every day. So that is in a way suggesting that you should actually sign up for the whole thing and subscribe. Exactly. So, so the publication system is kind of set up in a way that if you are a big university, then you can buy access for everybody who is in your university and say that these guys have access rights. If you are a small university, you can't afford to do this with every man. Because there are lots of these publications and each of them has their own publication system. And so that essentially um, is a kind of bias which says that if you are not part of a big university, then you are not going to get good education simply because you have no access to what is being done in the world. Um, and JSTOR started off as a collaboration between a bunch of universities to say, let's find a better way to archive these things instantly. So they started off, I don't remember when again, um, 80s or 90s, you know, it's like the history. 94. So they started off in 95 as a way of saying, let's take everything that was ever published on paper and scan it and put it in an online archive so at least it becomes easier to get a copy of it. You know, instead of paying for someone to go find a printed copy of something published 100 years ago, put out an article, why don't you just make it online? Um, so, JSTOR makes their money by charging you for access again. That's the only way to do it. Even though it is 100 years old, which means it is not in copyright. Copyright production is a uh, lifetime of the author plus 70 years, something like that. Um, so obviously if you have been dead for so many years, then whatever you have published is not copyrighted. I think it's 20 years after death. 20 years after death. Yeah. Plus it varies from country to country. In India it is 60 years. Years So, if something is out of copyright, um, this store still can't give it to you for free because they have to scan this thing, put on the servers, make sure the hard disk doesn't crash. Because unlike internet archive, which gives you everything for free, and therefore is not responsible for whether the hard disk survives or not. The store has to ensure that they do not ever lose anything in their archives, which means redundancy, which means completely more expenses. You know, everything costs more if you are giving multiple copies of anything. So, this was an expensive storage option. In 1995, if you want to go buy a one terabyte hard disk, um, it's even of saying that you want one petabyte hard disk today. Saying how much will that cost? I mean, a terabyte hard disk is not a lot of rupees these days, but back then it was a lot of money. And uh, scanned images are large. Most of these, if you try to scan a film, you pay an image and try to see what to do. Back then, the JPEG standard did not even exist. So, those are all TIFF images. They're much fatter when it comes to each image file. So, it was an expensive archive. They were completely justified in saying we have no option but to charge you for access. And uh, JSTOR essentially works on the basis of uh, university level deals. But if you are a university, then you can sign up for unlimited access to anybody who is in your network. Which means they check by IP address and say if you are on a certain range of IP addresses, there is no charge. If you are coming in as an individual, then you pay for membership. And obviously it's a lot of money if you buy it as an individual because you are not in a position to negotiate a good rate with an archive. So once again, this re-establishes the bias against smaller firms. Smaller universities or individual researchers don't have a similar level of access that the university has. If you want to get to a university, then you go through the admission process or find the other way in, which is a fairly high entry barrier. So, in effect, what you are doing is building a societal environment where your right to education is a matter of privilege, not a matter of right. Also, the premise is that the universities are publicly funded by taxpayers' money. So At some level, yes. So, the other problem is a lot of these universities are funded by public taxpayer money and therefore whatever you produce with that cannot be copyrighted. And the other part is even the private universities, a lot of research which is done is basically government agencies providing projects to the professors so yeah. it's not funding money. So there, there is a lot of public money. And um, so and there have been calls to reform saying that why are you doing this very expensive system of print publication anymore, which is where the expense is coming from. If you look at these two companies, that's a year and another day. Um, their operating margins are up to about 38 percent, which means 38 percent is the profit they make on their entire business, and that's a lot of money to be making. I mean, ultimately that's what you pay for you and pay thousand rupees tax as an article. That 38 percent of that is basically the best profit. Why are you paying that much? You know? And uh, 
fucking it over it. You can't do anything about it because they're private monopolies. They're private company. The university could not run this as a business. They sold the business. And now this is a private company. They have earned the right to charge this much because they have figured out to stay in business when the university could not. So that's one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is in social injustice. Now, how do you solve this problem? Now, this is very connected to morally ambiguous territory. Now, there is nothing illegal about this current setup. At the same time, it is not good for society. What can you do about this? Now, there are various ways to tackle this. Can you go to Congress and say, let's liberalize the way this is done, let's break these monopolies, let's um, provide government funding for universities so they can run their own architecture system? There are various ways to talk about this. Or you can try to say that let's run a campaign where we convince professors to only publish in journals which don't charge people for looking at them on the internet. Um, now this is a point where it's questionable whether what Iran Swartz did was morally right or wrong. Uh, but at this point, he was working at Harvard University. He was a fellow over there, and therefore he had free access to the campus. And uh, Harvard University happens to be across the road from MIT University. In the sense that they're both in the same city, they're just across the road from each other. And obviously the guy was very well known for all his previous exploits, you know. And he was a bit of a local hero. So it was perfectly okay for him to walk into MIT's campus at any time he pleased because everybody knows him. And uh, he went to MIT, pulled out his laptop and started downloading articles from JSTOR. Now he could have done this in Harvard. Nobody knows why he didn't do it in Harvard. Uh, because Harvard also has JSTOR access. But he said in MIT, every day he would go there, open his laptop, start his download program and just sit around. And um, MIT has an open network. So MIT's network allows anybody to access the internet. And uh, MIT is one of the earliest universities to get internet access, which means they have a class A IP block. Now, who knows what a class A IP block is? First digit. Sorry? Is it the first three digits of the IP? The first three digits. So you know an IP address has four digits. Yeah. And <coughs> extra <coughs> wide or z dot, whatever. And, um, that's that those digits are routing address and a class A IP block is anything that is between 1 and 127, 126 actually, 127 is the private range. So if you have an IP range that starts with number between 1 and 126, it means the remaining three digits are entirely your network. Okay? Because of the way network routing works, the earliest versions of internet routing were very, very stupid about how they did routing. So, if you were in the class A range, the entire class A range is one part of the internet. And um, if it's class B, then you look at the sub range and so forth. So any university that got access to a class A range in the early days had basically an unlimited supply of public IP addresses, whereas the rest of the internet sits on dynamic IP addresses, and NAT and whatever else bullshit that we poor people have delivered. Now MIT has a class A IP address range, which means you get on the network, you get a public IP address on their LAN. And that means that I go sit to the laptop on their network. My laptop can be accessed from uh, anybody on the internet because it's a public IP address. It's not a private IP address range, it's has a firewall on it. So it's kind of giving away a lot of access because mm -hmm. I can now go sit at my laptop in MIT and run a server and claim to be within MIT because my IP address is within MIT and run something that the whole world can see. Um, it's just a bit of risk for MIT because it's all going through their network and therefore it is some level of um, a statement on their part saying that you know this minor we are endorsing somebody's activities on our network. Uh, Fortunately for them they are also a very open university and they say basically we don't care. You know? We don't care what you do, it's free access. Um, this guy goes in, sits in this laptop, starts downloading. At some point people notice and say that there's a lot of download happening on some machine in the network. And they try to shut him down. And um, which basically at the network level and say that let's find out who this guy is sitting on our land, who's downloading so much. Um, he's using up a lot of the bandwidth. Um, can we cut off internet access to his laptop? And so the network admins obviously have no idea who on campus is doing what. They all, all, all that they know is there's some guy on campus sitting on the Wi-Fi. So they tried shutting him down a few times and uh, shutting down basically means block your MAC address. MAC address. And uh, if anyone knows what a MAC address is, it's the hardware serial number on your Ethernet card. Uh, it is supposed to be unique, it is not so in practice. Because ultimately you cannot manufacture hardware with some unique part in the software. You know? um, that's a very difficult thing to manufacture. So what manufacturer will do is it's a part of the firmware and you can override the MAC address at your firmware knows. And it's common practice when you know security functions to change your MAC address every once in a while so that you don't leave a track record of having been on a certain network. 
it's a very common thing to do. And uh, most people don't know this, so you know it's in your MAC address. And so the easiest way to block someone on that is to prevent their MAC address from being given a MAC address. So they did that to So the guy basically assigned himself a manual IP address because when his MIT is crashing, it was about this huge pool of IP addresses and all of them are valid. And remained on the network for a while. And essentially he spent a few days causing the network by this, changing his MAC address, just basically assigning himself an IP address without waiting for it. Server and so forth. Um, if you are a network engineer, if you are an IT person, this is normal. For the government, this is illegal. He is pretending to be somebody else. Now, that was one of the charges that the government used to put on him uh, for fraud because he changes the back address on his machine, uh, which is completely ridiculous because this is something that all of us do all the time anyway. MIT's own network does this for public access. If you look at um, Wi-Fi. If you some Wi-Fi access points, you may notice have both private and public access. And you can say the private SSID is for my use, the public SSID is for anybody who's walking to my house to use, but the public SSID has a bandwidth cap. And it can only do a certain kind of speed, it can't go beyond that. Now this is a feature that could be a router to come to Why one from the link for 1500 rupees has this feature? How does it implement this? It spoofs back ID. Pretends to be two different MAC IDs at the same time. So it is a completely nominal instrument thing. <coughs> That's what he did to bypass their filtering. Um, eventually, he got bored of doing this. So he walked into the building, uh, and there was a certain cupboard in the building which a homeless man used to use to keep his clothes. And the fellow went to put his laptop inside that to connect it to the actual the report. Because it was a buying cabinet. Now, what's interesting is a homeless man kept his clothes in the same cupboard, okay? uh, which means a beggar on the street. Okay? And MIT is a place that was open enough to allow that to happen. Uh, and this guy goes in, puts his laptop there, leaves it running for a few days. And um, MIT discovers that this is where the big download is happening from. JSTOR, meanwhile, is looking at the servers and saying, somebody is doing a like, non-stop download of articles and who's reading so much so fast. And they go suspicious. They shut down access to MIT for a couple of days. Trying to say, boss, what are you doing? <laughs> and so MIT's entire JSTOR access went on for two days. Uh, now if you are a university as large as MIT, this is something that will make national headlines. Say that something is going on in this network and MIT's assignments don't know what to make of it. And at this point they had already figured out that somebody is going to put a laptop in the cupboard and that's what doing this downloading. They have no idea who did this. So they put a camera watching that. Uh, cupboard to see who comes and opens the door. And uh, for whatever reason, Elon Swartz decides that uh, the next time he visits this place, he's going to put a mask on himself because he's afraid of being seen. Okay? So he comes in looking very suspicious. Now, we don't know if the guy was actually afraid of being seen or what it was, um, but he went into retrieve his laptop, and that's when he might call the police and got him arrested. He's saying, We don't know who this guy is, he's doing something suspicious on our network. Um, so when this happened, now just told me who the heck was downloading. Okay. And they obviously asked him through what the heck. And he said, so I'm just downloading your articles, you know. Any article in your archive that is public domain out of copyright, I'll give it out. The rest I don't care for. But until I download it, I don't know what the copyright status is. Just okay. said, oh this is it, and said, okay, forget about it. End of case with JSTOR. But MIT is like, we don't know what to do. So they left alone, they didn't make a statement. At this point the government, which had spent so long waiting for this guy to do something that they could take him to court for. He said, aha, you broke into their campus. You defrauded them by faking your identity when you changed your MAC address. And so that was the case they put against him. Uh, so they initially had four different cases that they put in. Impersonation, wire fraud, uh, unauthorized entry into campus. Mind you, there's a homeless man's clothes in the same cupboard. So if that is okay, what's wrong with this guy putting his laptop there? Um, so. They took a bunch of these charges and uh, essentially so put him up for, for prosecution. And the prosecutor is this woman named Carmen Ortiz, who is a public prosecutor. Her job is to do this. And she made a public statement at that point saying, stealing is stealing. doesn't matter whether you used a crowbar and broke a door or you downloaded something. You're still violating the law and you will go to jail. And um, the case um, began in 2011. Um, so initially, Carmen Artis put out uh, the court case 
asking for 35 years in jail for downloading articles from my website. Um, and uh, at the end of 2012, she had taken it all the way up to 50 years. And saying that this is the punishment for what you did, to make sure nobody does something like this again. <coughs> now you know that's completely ridiculous. Um, the problem is, Kevin's words the physical will admit that he was guilty of anything. I mean, he's just downloading stuff. It's not like MIT told you that you can't use their network. You know, at no point did they give you notice saying that these are the terms under which you can use the network. JSTOR said, this is all it is, we don't care. You know, we are not going to make a case out of this. Uh, but the government wants to the, 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 the Yeah, he did not actually release the, 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 what he downloaded. He returned all the data that he had yeah, on his... Yes. Uh, so, that, that is where the court case began. And uh, if you know anything about fighting a court case in the US, it's not cheap. I mean, first of all, there's this history of what it costs is to do basic research on what your own situation is to face and so forth. And uh, he spent roughly about 1.5 million dollars just defending himself and saying, I'm innocent. Um, at the end of it, obviously, whatever money he made on Reddit was gone. He was bankrupt. His parents were uh, selling their house to raise enough money to cover for his court case. Uh, everybody believed that there was no way he could actually be elected of any criminal activity. Uh, but it was a matter of actually fighting it out in court. And the thing is, you're not going to get your money back because it's a public prosecutor. You know, it's the cost of fighting this case is entirely on you, which means that you're still going to lose your money no matter what you do. Uh, and that was the situation he was looking at. And the other part is he tried explaining in public, saying that this is what's happened to me. I need help, I need money, I need something. But the judge will put a case uh, on him, notice on him saying that if you go public about this and try to gain sympathy for your case, I will consider contempt of court. Okay. So he was charged with that and saying that you are not allowed to go talk in public about what is going on. Don't try to go do a public campaign, try to get sympathy for yourself. And so that was what he was stuck with. And so he couldn't explain saying what was going on. And as far as the public could see it, there was some idiot kid doing something silly, got in trouble, now he's trying to work in for help and screw him. So he was stuck with that for a long time. And um, he was a, also had a long medical history of depression. So um, ultimately he got to the stage where he figured there was no point in any of this and went and killed himself. Um, and, um, that's how it ended. And it's only now that people have finally become aware of what they was actually going on. Uh, and a lot of people are out there saying that, look, this was something that we managed to fight out in court. We would have come out on top. We would have probably put the prosecutor out of business. You know, put her out of a job. Instead, he went and killed himself because this thing completely dovetailed with the depression that he was already suffering. So, uh, and that's one of the reasons why there's so many people very, very upset about this right now. It's, um, it's extremely unfortunate that someone who has done such remarkable work, both technically and as an activist, who's achieved so much, ended up taking his life so early. And it also says something about how the legal system works in the US. That it's one thing to say you have fair trial and so forth, but for a prosecutor, they can still basically bleed you of your wealth until you give up. And it's now brought in uh, to highlighted the number of cases where this may actually have been happening. That somebody agrees to plead guilty just so that they can stop being screwed in life. I believe his ex-girlfriend and a few other known family friends were also pressured into making statements against him. Yes. So, the Pin Norton was forced to testify against him. And her testimony was being used by Cardinal for as part of the family. Exemption from exactly. something. Yeah, they give you exemption from the law if you agree to testify. Yeah. So what is the first to give a What is Pinotin not nice to do with this? Uh, Pinotin, she was just brought in because she had known him at that point. Hmm? She was brought in the case hmm. because she had known him through his previous history. Okay. How did they equate uh, gaining public safety as uh, contempt of court? Uh, so, you know, court proceedings are supposed to be private. Okay. Okay. Like in India, for instance. I think judges have wide latitude on how they give contempt of court. They can actually do it. Yeah, even a mobile phone ringing in the court can be treated as contempt. Actually implemented there. 
We also have that, but it's never implemented. We also have perjury and content of code, but it's never implemented. That's the basic difference. I don't think that he actually paid for it. I don't know if I'm actually It's not changing. He's not doing it. Most people believe that he must have paid for it, because nobody's going to get access to all of it. So the thing is, um, the data itself is not copyrighted. No, it's not demo link. It's uh, when you crawl the data and then you can crawl the data. I don't think it was available for the quality. I need to do this software, but probably there is a way of calling it where it's very... No, I mean, uh, when I was working with him at the time. Okay. Okay. So, uh, what, I don't know the time where we're thinking that library of forms is going to submit because we got this data. And, okay. So, I've uh, uh, never actually heard anything that actually I haven't paid for that to actually get the data. No, I don't think he revealed it. So, people, a lot of people believe that he must have paid for it because uh, that is the only explanation that makes sense. How else would he get access to all the data? For those who don't know this, Anand works in Internet Archive. He was working with Aaron for uh, many of this, uh, for a fair bit of this period. Um, so, part of what we're trying to do today, one, is to make sure we all know the story. You know, for a lot of people have never heard of any of this. And uh, it's very easy to think of this as being some idiot kid who um, was depressed and committed suicide and set a bad example for society. Um, and that's a very, very simplistic reading of this. I've seen a lot of blogging about there was an article uh, read a couple of days back. It said uh, Bill Gates wrote some kind of a virus at some point which brought down a network. Yeah. Uh, Steve Jobs and Wozniak actually started off Apple uh, building blue boxes which make free phone calls, uh, free long distance calls, yeah. which is actually committing a crime. Yeah. And they were never charged. So this law which is being used against them was brought about in the 1980s. And at that point, accessing a remote computer meant you needed to have a username and password and stuff. There was no concept of a web where you could anyone could just access a machine and get data out. Yeah, so the, the laws that were used against him are the just technical laws. And computers at that point were also very expensive and yeah. data was val yeah. much more valuable in terms of any kind of damage that you would cause. What are the parallels for India? Like for Terms of these laws that, that we should be aware of. Because I, I mean, I think we read a lot about the US laws. So, Sunil, I don't know. Can we check with Sunil? I don't know if he's coming or not. So, Sunil Abraham, who's the director of this place, Central Indian Society, um, his work is entirely about Indian law. Okay? Um, and Anish Prakash, who's the lead researcher here, is unfortunately not here. He's in Chennai today. Because uh, uh, he had already planned this trip and he couldn't come back in time. So he could be doing one more memorial service for Iran no, here on the 23rd. We're not doing that. Not doing that? Can not doing that. Yeah. yeah, so it's, it's <coughs> I mean, Pranesh, if he was here, would have told that because he's a lawyer. And uh, he spent the last two years working with the government, lobbying them, trying to do that. Yeah. We could probably find a lot of his work which is published on the CIS website. Yeah, just go to CISindia.org. You'll see all of his work over there, okay. commentary on it. And some of it is also on the notice board upstairs. So basically out here also we have the same kind of a situation where and it's actually worse in India because yeah. at least there uh, he, he, yeah. he was out of jail fighting his case. Here it's like the moment the case is lodged against you, you are taking your arrested. Uh, so like two girls got arrested just for clicking a like button. Uh, like button. Uh, uh, now, last week some guy in uh, uh, Kerala uh, who lives in the UAE or something, he apparently clicked a like button on a page on Facebook which said I love Pakistan. And uh, so they have filed a case against him of huh. sedition. The thing is, we don't have clear-cut IT laws like the US has. No, we do. We, we, do. But we, have, we have. We don't have people to understand huh? them. That's yeah, it, the interpretation varies like from zero to infinity in India. Yes, sir. It, no, it but, all depends no, the, on how they... The laws are very widely defined, so there's no... It has I mean, it has things like and offensive thing, okay. and a lot of words which are not clearly different, which can vary from person to person. But also, if you look at the, you know, the the law in India is actually quite ridiculous on a number of fronts. Uh, for instance, um, if you have an internet access point at home, a Wi-Fi station, and you give it, you give access to a friend who's visiting your house. Now, what may, what does it mean between the two of you? The law actually has a definition for this. It means you're a cyber company. <coughs> this is ridiculous. I mean, you're not a cyber company. You're not charging somebody to come at your house and use the internet. Even uh, at home, you can't keep an open Wi-Fi. You can't have an open Wi-Fi. Because 
basically in India you are not allowed to get internet access unless your identity is taken down at some point. And if your ID is not taken down, then the next person's ID is taken as yours. And it's not just about the ID, you are also supposed to keep track of what the person did on the net. Yeah. yeah. And Who this access is, what and this is technically meant to prevent terrorism and some terrorist using a cyber cafe as a way to send an email so that he can't be traced. Uh, but what it means in practice is if you share internet with somebody, you are legally responsible for everything he does on the internet. Um, he says something offensive to the government, you are responsible for that. You could be arrested for it. You could be arrested for it, exactly. And, and this also is a problem when, say, you come to a place like this. You come here and use the internet, do something that pisses off the government. Mr. Sunil Abraham is going to jail for that, even though he's not here. He's not responsible for what you did. What he did was give you a public service by making the space available for you to use. And he's constantly walking around with the risk that you will do something that gets him into jail. And that's what the law says, that he's actually responsible for what you did. Um, it becomes an even bigger problem if you say run a conference, well that's what I do. Uh, my firm has it, and a bunch of us here, we run technology conferences, which usually have about three to four hundred people showing up at one place. You do something online there, I'm the one who is here for it. Despite the fact that I'm running a conference to help you learn more about what's going on in the world. So, and that basically then becomes a risk factor. Now it's fine as long as I'm nobody that the government doesn't care for. If I end up being an activist who's also visibly causing embarrassment to the government, and I happen to run a conference in which somebody did something stupid, now I'm a very convenient target to be taken down in the name of the law. Uh, and Sunil is actually doing things to embarrass the government. CIS, which means that he is taking a lot more risk and that is a bit of a level of gratitude you should actually appreciate and say that wow, you know, he's actually willing to do this and say that let's go show the government how to do things the right way. Wasn't CIS doing something to try and repeal the sedition yes. law? The sedition. Not the sedition law, they yeah, the did sedition. something to repeal 66A, they basically pointed out how it could be abused. How, um, how it could be abused to <coughs> curb free speech. Because see, the thing is, Sato, there are other parts of the law which cause other problems. For instance, there is no point, at no point does the law require you to actually go to court and get a judge to read what you say. So if I say that a comment posted by somebody on a news article is offensive to my sentiments, the newspaper website is responsible for taking the comment off. Despite the fact that a newspaper is supposed to be something that is out there promoting free speech, the law requires them to cover it. Only because I'm upset. I didn't even have to go to a court and tell the judge that look that guy is saying something offensive. I just have to tell the newspaper that under the IT Act, you better take this down or I will send you to jail right away. No judge involved in this whole process, no judicial oversight. Uh, and uh, when this law was written, <coughs> CIS pointed this out and said, boss, guys in the government, what are you doing? Now, how did you remove the judiciary from this? I mean, the intention for the government was obviously to say that you can't let, wait let the government go through the courts and somebody is embarrassing the government. I mean, that was partly the thought process behind this. But what it means is that as a private citizen, I can do what I want. Anybody on the internet saying anything I don't like, it's my right to take it. Jace, at this point, I have a question. When you say the law was written, um, how are the laws written in India? That is, that is complicated. You should ask Pranesh for that. Uh, I can try to explain, but I will probably be simplifying it because uh, I understand only a small part of the whole process. Uh, it is not as stupid as it sounds either. You know? uh, it is usually not malice, it is usually stupidity. Because of the fact that most of the guys who do this process are just way too busy to understand the larger implications of what they are doing. Now, uh, to prove that this is indeed a problem, what CIS did, uh, when they first sent this commentary to the government saying that this law could potentially be abused in this manner, the government refused to listen to it. They said that is theory, nothing will happen in practice. So to prove it, CIS picked a bunch of newspapers, with a bunch of completely random offensive comments, which as you know, every newspaper article has these days. And anything that says something about some guy, you know, looked at a woman the wrong way on the street, there may be a bunch of comments saying, can't the best penis off, or something ridiculous like that. A completely offensive comments out of proportion with what the article is about. But the thing now is, under the section 66A, you can still get the comment taken down. Whereas previously, the free speech law of the country would prevent you from doing that. Uh, so to prove it, CIS clicked a bunch of articles with slightly offensive comments 
and sent a notice to the newspaper sales saying on your website there is this particular comment, this particular URL that is offensive to me, please take it down, as per the law. Guess what? Everyone of them complied. They went to remove stuff on the website because CIS was complaining saying that it's offensive. Um, do, do you have to say what ground it's offensive? Or? No. no. Can somebody say, just say, the sky like is blue, it. and you yeah. say, I, yeah. I disagree. Yeah, like for example, you, you can say, like for example, I mean, the color green. If, if a community says that this is like, identified, identifies with us, so and you've written something offensive, so right. it, it can be used well, What I'm saying is, what if I'm not even saying anything offensive? What if I just say something like, what if I make a comment like, the but sky so, is blue? So the basic thing is that whoever you wrote to, um, you need to get him to a point where he doubts whether he's right or not. You know, say, if it's something like sky is blue, the guy will laugh at you and say, boss, go off. Mm. Yeah? Uh, I don't think you're serious. Uh, but go off can be... But, but uh, who, no, but my point <laughs> is... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure, my, point, my point is, who, who, who is to say serious? Who is to determine serious? See, I, is it, is it, no, no, it's, it's like, like, like the guy, mm. you, I put a blog post, okay. I say something and you don't like it. Fine. Okay, you're going to come and tell me and we'll take it off. Okay. I, I'm not going to, I'm going to look at it as, okay, uh, normally I would say, you know, it's my blog, my words, do what you want. But then if you're going to threaten me and say Article 66, I'm going to sue you to court. Mm -hmm. I'm going to look at it in terms of how much of my time and money and resources are going to be lost in just fighting you. And then at that point, I'm going to say, you know, that one line over there is, is not worth uh, yeah. the thing. So I might just take it yeah, off. So, so which is the reason why they picked offensive comments and basically said that this is inciting religious hatred or offensive to my community or whatnot, which are terms that you would not laugh away and say, I'm not concerned about what you think. And they use that. God but the entire law is based on these kind of words, which are not clearly. If you this, notice, which from person to none person. of the very few newspapers allow you to comment. If they do, they require an email ID. Of mm -hmm. course, you can give a. And they also email require ID. moderation before they post the comment yes. and so forth. And these some of them have of shut down the comment system altogether. Uh, they don't let you post any comments. Uh, there are very few, but uh, most of them, like I don't remember offhand, but. I think the Hindu doesn't allow you to comment at all. No, it allows. It allows. Hindu is very highly moderated. It's highly moderated. I don't remember which one, but some of them have shut down comments completely. This happened on the HSI website, which is... Yeah, somebody used... Somebody sent us a... 66A on the HSI website, Hacker Street India, which is a completely obscure website that only a few hundred people know about. Oh, the other one was... Hayes dot... Was it Hester D or whatever? I don't know. Ankit Faria's... I'm not sure. So basically, Ankit Faria and some other guy were running a so-called ethical hacking company which was scamming everyone. And they used some German security researcher as a supposed partner in their firm and label and used it in advertising and stuff. So that, that person made a, a statement on his site saying that uh, these statements, these claims by them are untrue, I have nothing to do with them. And uh, these guys have gone to court and got the Indian uh, government to block the uh, complete website. From being from viewed in, in India. India. Viewed in India. So, and, and then he goes around with his certification. You Google for it and you'll never land up on that side. So that that is the state of the law in India and the CIS this country. And also the thing that you get arrested immediately without it's a non available offense and everything. So there was a guy from Bangalore who got arrested for supposedly posting a comment about Shivaji on Orkut or something. I think he and, was one of us. And, and he got, uh, he was put in jail for a few months. And eventually it turned out that he wasn't even the person who did the uh, comment. Uh, yeah, uh, they were given the wrong IP address. Yeah. yeah. They gave <laughs> them. <laughs> and they couldn't tell the difference between 4 p.m. and 4 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so he had, so he had that address on the, on the different 12 hour period. Someone yeah, so had mentioned, I hate Sonia Gandhi on Facebook, they had a... Well, that was, uh, Indian Airlines employees got, a couple of people who were striking from Air India or whatever, two employees got arrested uh, 
for supposedly posting some comment about Sonia Gandhi on Facebook. Yeah, there was a community so for that. This is again a thing, like you would, you would be posting a comment, they don't really care, but the moment they want to actually so, so get back more, on you. More fundamentally, so, so how, how, is, I mean, how did this get passed? How is this free speech? I mean, so this has obviously been there in, in, in India, we've had this communal mm -hmm. tension and all that. No, no, this, no, this act has been in force for about the last 40 years. For this particular one. But, but even before, I mean, there's all these things that against... Yeah, we have a lot we, of bad laws in India. Right. And it doesn't... Uh, and I guess what is... I guess, I guess it would be Pranish, if he was here, he was here, he could sort of talk about what is the... So Sunil will be here in about an hour. Um, he just came back from Delhi last night and he had a very late night, so he said, uh, he will come here earlier. But um, you can ask Sunil about what CIA is best. <coughs> a fair bit of background on uh, their efforts and why they exist as an organization and take this kind of initiative. Okay. Uh, CIS is uh, not like a lot of uh, organizations that you are more familiar with, like EFF. You know, the EFF, for instance, is in the US a collection of lawyers who actually go fight cases in court and they see injustice being done because of some law that does not has not been updated for the modern age. Uh, and that's basically what they do. If it's something like an Iran Swartz case, it's usually going to be the EFF of paying for a lawyer to go and represent him in court because they think um, stupid laws need to be repealed. Uh, CIS does not do that. CIS it is not a sensible idea to be trying to do that kind of thing in India because the funding is very severely cut in, unlike this in the US. Uh, as a non profit, you are not allowed to get money from abroad unless it has been very specifically approved for the kind of activities you do. And, uh, it becomes much easier to shut down someone trying to do any form of social activism in that sense. So what CIS instead focuses on is uh, peaceful negotiation of the government, pointing out flaws in their own process, and saying that this is how you should do it, don't do it the way you're doing it. So they try to not be offensive to the government, they instead try to say, uh, what you're saying is fine, but look at what's wrong with it. And that's why they do things like what they did, uh, trying to prove the government that the law is stupid despite what you think, because I have proven the fact that it's very easy to get newspapers to censor themselves. So was that changed? Um, no. It's going to be a long term effort. It's not as simple thing as that. Uh, it's still not going, you know. And, but uh, at least are, are they negotiating? Are they? But so here's, here's what happened now. Uh, so the department responsible for this is currently headed by Kapil Sibal. Oh. And, um, well, you know Kapil Sibal has uh, put in more cases also. Um, but part of what's happening now is that he's agreed to form a committee of industry experts um, to come and discuss the law and find out how to do it the right way. And he made a list. And supposedly good move because now he's saying that let's get a committee of experts. Pranish looks at this list and says, there's nobody here who's from the public. Now, you're getting a bunch of ISPs to come in and say uh, that they will figure out what is wrong with the law. And you're getting some guy from the Department of Telecom, some guy from various government departments. Who in this list is representing the common man? You know, essentially by not having any economic interest in a certain way of operations in this country. And this is just, what's wrong with your list, you know? Um, it's a very biased list in this case now. You've got a bunch of guys who are interested only in one part of the larger impact that your law has. So he's he's been busy making a hue and cry about that. He was in Delhi also the last few days trying to get the attention of some various different government officials. And part of what CIS does is they spend a lot of time making people aware of um, their work. And uh, for us that would basically mean <coughs> you put it on the blog and you tweet about it and you Facebook about it. But that's not what CIS does. Because that is a very stupid way to actually get heard in India. Yeah. What they do instead is they print copies of all their work and mail it to every single government official they come across, anywhere in the world. Yeah. And uh, if you come in here on a typical day, you'll find a huge stack of envelopes that's waiting to be mailed out. And that, that's basically what they do non-stop. The moment you've done some work and you think there's something that people should know about, make sure everybody gets a physical copy of it. Yeah. So uh, that's one of their approaches to getting attention for what they're doing. So, I think what, one question, there was something I saw recently about uh, some analysis that uh, Aaron Schwartz had apparently done on Wikipedia data. Yes. Uh, I, I didn't quite understand what it was okay. they've done so, then. Um, 
Uh, Alan Schweitz was one of the most qualified contributors to Wikipedia also. Um, if you look at Wikipedia's rankings for the most number of contributions, he's within the top 1,500, which is the list that they publish. This means of millions of people who use Wikipedia, he's one of the most active people actually adding material to the website. And that basically puts him in part of the elite circle. And uh, Jimmy Wales, who's the founder, at one point put out an article explaining how Wikipedia works uh, as per his understanding. And he said, um, despite the fact that there are so many people reading Wikipedia, there are only about 500 people who are responsible for the entire content. These are the 500 group of 500 active people who have gone and built this encyclopedia. They are also students, so that sounds ridiculous. 500 people are all that you need to you know, get the entire world's knowledge and put it on the website. That's a ridiculously short number for how many people there are in the world and how much knowledge there is. So he went on to do his own research. And uh, uh, Jimmy Wentz's claim was based on edit records. He said, look, only 500 people are actually very active editors on Wikipedia. They are the ones who are always out contributing to the site. So what Kerouch was said is, let's try to see what's wrong with his analysis. What is Jimmy Wentz doing wrong that shows him 500 as a figure? And he said, what he has done is gone and looked at the number of edits. How many times have you edited the encyclopedia sorted by that list? He says, Let's make a ranking and you see only 500 of these guys actually have frequent edits. The rest of these guys are a lot of edits you've never seen again. And it says, in the new answer, let's make that basically means the rest of these guys happen to stumble on the site, do something and go away. Now, one of the reasons this is important is uh, the editing interface for the encyclopedia. Um, if it is not user friendly, then it's a question of what happens when somebody comes to us and edit for the very first time. How confused are they? Obviously, that, that is a that is an important factor. Uh, but if only 500 people are repeat editors, then you don't have to be so worried because they know how to use this. Okay. So do you, can you justify the foundation's money on getting more people to edit the encyclopedia when that money is being wasted because only these 500 people already know how to do this, otherwise are retaining it? Or should you be spending your efforts on getting the contributors to make it easier for them? Yeah. And that's an important one because as a foundation that is running on public money, where do you spend your money on? What is worth spending it on? So Wales is a student, out of 500. Look at the edit history. These are the guys making all the changes. Aaron Swartz looked this, and so this is his. There must be something wrong here. So what he does instead is goes and counts the number of bytes that you add to the article when you use the same. says, let's count it, not by number of times you edit it, but by how much content you've added in the edit. And this analysis said, it was a complete opposite. These 500 people are doing spell checking and grammar correction. They are the guys who are basically doing the gardening, you know, like you go cut the weeds in the garden. That's what they are doing. They are looking at the articles and saying, hey, there's something wrong there. You know, there's a spelling mistake over there. There is a link that's missing over there. Perfect. But they are not the ones who are actually contributing the basic knowledge of the Wikipedia contents. And in his estimate, he found that what he instead had, a lot of people who edit only one article, but they write the full article, submit it and then go and never come back again. And essentially, that meant that you had people who were really knowledgeable about a certain topic, who may or may not be comfortable with the Wikipedia's writing style, which is, it also has a very specific writing style. So what they do instead is contribute a huge article, putting down everything they know about a certain topic, and they know only about this topic, so they don't edit anything else. And they put it down. And then you get this gang of 500 who come in and say, let's go make all the corrections required to meet the style guide of the encyclopedia. So you're mistaking those guys for actually contributing the knowledge that some outside did. Okay. And that was what his research turned up. And obviously it was very embarrassing for Jimmy Wales to be told that you don't know how your own encyclopedia works. <laughs>
I thought was he was working on their project. What's wrong? Uh, uh, Victor Peter. He called him. Uh, so he could be and uh, he was leading that project to make the other campaigns as vital as the as the other one. So the one this. Yeah, uh, with demand for this. And uh, he had discussed a lot of uh, the short -term, short term goals and long term goals uh, very openly with me just the last week that this has happened. Mm -hmm. Uh, he was very clear on what to do, what to focus on, what are the campaigns and how it is going to be different from other campaign sites like ours and whatever. I mean, there are lots of uh, other campaign sites uh, yeah. which are already there. And when I asked him how is it going to be different, he had he had answered it very elaborately um, on how it is going to be different. Mm. Uh, so it was a complete shock for me. You see that it is a it is a depression. I mean, as the others say, during the depressed period. Yeah. So it could be <coughs> just a moment. Say so. I, I don't know. I'm not yet uh, sure of what it is. But mm. uh, the the project he, he just started uh, a month back and uh, the revamp of it. And as you know, he was he was thinking of hiring a designer and uh, other campaigners for this. Uh, so he asked me to so, uh, yeah, so asked introduce me. Rahul to uh, Avishwaj mm -hmm. just like three four days before that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 